back with me, putting a smile on my face, is Sharon Evan and, of course, Kian Golzari. This week, we are going to be talking. What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about today inspections and quality control. And, yeah. Kian, what else are we speaking about? Can you hear us, yeah, Kian? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, basically, inspections, nope. quality control. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so what, what we're going to do, to break it down, we're going to talk about arranging your pre-shipment inspection. Most people know how to do this, but there are there's a bit of an art to it as well. AQL and returns, testing your samples to industry for legal standards, NDAs, NNNs, and then obviously look at the payment protection, which is really important at the moment with the, the current climate with some of these factories going down, right? Even though if you've been working with them for years. So uh, without further ado, Sharon, do you want to give a little bit of background on yourself while I share to the groups? And then we'll move um, on to Kian. Yes. Yeah, so uh, my name is Sharon Evan, and I <laughs> I need to I need to get a, a, like a floor of what who I am. So my name is Sharon Evan, and I sell at Amazon, and I sell off of Amazon, and I do YouTube, and I have a Facebook group called Amazon FBA Alphas, and I do one on one coaching, and that's me. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Cool. Uh, I'm in a similar situation as Sharon. Uh, I've got a Facebook group sourcing with Kian, uh, as you can see here. And also, yeah, living and working in China for the past 10 years, specialized in manufacturing product development, uh, work with brands uh, on Amazon, but also off of Amazon, uh, retailers licenses like the NBA, Olympics, uh, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, just enjoying this time uh, during quarantine and looking forward to another great episode with yourself, Danny and Sharon. Excellent. So you just use the words enjoying your time in quarantine. I am actually, you know, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty children. weird to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that, that's a good point. But it, it feels weird to say that I'm actually really enjoying this time. Obviously, there's great things yeah. going on in the world. But like, I mean, for me personally, um, like, I, I like it. Like it's, it's it's going good. Like I've enjoyed this time at home and focus on the right things. The focus and getting shit done, where you're not out and yeah. distracted and stuff like that. You're actually being super productive in this time. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, Owen's here as well. Says hi. Oh, Juan's here. Good morning, masters. I think he's talking about you two. So how's here? Best oh. part of the day. Thank you, Sir How. Andrew here. Hello, Jensen lady, and Andrew again. Good to see you soon. In the feed, we've got Rowan, Cindy's here, Lee Chapman, Michael's here as well. Um, okay, so let's start getting into things. Uh, let's take it right back from the top. Everyone knows how to organise a pre-shipment inspection, but a lot of people don't bother and they just sling their products into Amazon after spending an absolute fortune on stock and then wonder why they, uh, they get returns and complaints on their reviews. So who wants to start with this one? Yeah, what do you want to do? do you want, I don't mind starting. Um, sure. It's it's actually funny though that you're saying that, um, Danny, because in my experience, a lot of sellers don't get inspections. Exactly. Um, a lot of sellers don't get inspections, and they don't understand the repercussions of it and mm. how much money it's actually going to cost you if mm. there is. I don't have another word for it apart from if there's a fuck up. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, it's it's something that is crucial and I'm going to, because Kian and I both have so much knowledge on the subject, so um, I'll talk Kian more about the Amazon side of it and I'll let you speak about yeah. the, because we, we could both speak about the same thing. So yeah, sure, sure. Kian, Kian will talk about the inspection side of it um, and I'll talk about the Amazon side of it as well. So what people cool. also need to understand is that once your product hits Amazon and I'm going to give you um, a, a, something that's happened to me uh, in the past as well. You can't remove that until it has been um, uh, spread amongst all of the Amazon warehouses and only then can you create a, a removal order. So something that happened to me is the first thing I will say is that every single one of your shipments no matter how long you have been working with a supplier whether you've got 10 years five years three years it doesn't matter how much you trust them you should always have an inspection done before the the, the cargo leaves their warehouse i once needed to get a product in asap like really really quickly i, I didn't want to go out of stock it was a best-selling product and we had i think it was five thousand units on the way i have a, a whole like youtube video about it my youtube and I 
for the first time ever, did not get an inspection done and I had it air expressed. Now getting an inspection done would have delayed this by one day, would have delayed it by 24 hours. I didn't do it. And I am so, so lucky that I have such an amazing relationship with the supplier. And she sent me a WeChat and she said, Sharon, I'm really, really sorry. The adhesive on this specific product is, is not good. Hmm. Now, I don't know if you've ever needed to stop a shipment from arriving to Amazon when it's DHL courier, but it is almost impossible. It is almost impossible to change the address of the final address of the final destination. So I found myself in a, in a situation where I've got 5,000 units of a product being sent to Amazon that's faulty and it's going to get me like heaps of one star reviews and it could like stuff up the entire listing. I was very, very, very lucky that I used the freight forwarder, so I was able to stop it. But I did get one uh, one box that did still arrive into Amazon. But just so people understand, had that arrived at Amazon, I would have needed to wait until all of the 5,000 units would have been spread amongst all of the Amazon's uh, warehouses, which could have even taken 28 days. And only then would I have been able to create a removal order, which would have cost me 50 cents per unit. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I've been through myself and it is absolutely crucial and people need to understand how it can affect your Amazon, Amazon specifically. It's just not worth it. No, I like agree. Anyway. I mean, you think about it, you can pay as low as 188 a day. 180. Per yeah, 180 mm -hmm. up to 300. It's fuck all. It's pittance when you're putting down 15, 20, 30 plus thousands. And the mess, the fucking mess to clear that up for six months after. The bullshit you have to go with your factory. I don't understand how people can just, that's just mindless to so not usually, spend that money. It's usually between $180 to $300 per, per manpower day, usually. Because yeah, right. sometimes if you've got a lot of, you, you may need more than one. Now, just before we move on to Kiet, I have an example of a product here because I speak about it in the YouTube video. So about two years ago, we almost... <laughs> Everyone's going to laugh because it's such a terrible product. We almost added the jade rollers to mm -hmm. our beauty brand. And I've got a jade roller here because it was a sample that I was sent. Mm -hmm. And I specifically always let my suppliers know beforehand in, when I'm getting quotes, I always let them know that I'm going to have a 3D, left like, 3D, a three third party inspection done. So I let them know that I'm going to have, it's part of a, it's part of a thing that they know I'm going to get a three third party inspection done. And no one, apart from one supplier, agreed to let me have a three, a three uh, third party inspection come in. Hmm. And I didn't really know the product that well at the time. It was when it, it was just when jade rollers became like a thing, like two years ago. And uh, I later realized it was because the jade roller here is made out of jade, so it was continuously being sent, like it was breaking on the way there. But that to me, I ended up not even going into that product at the time. Part of that reason was because of, because of the quality control. But that, that is something that like to me, it's a make or break whether I get into a, a work with, with a company as well. Yeah. Ken, let's let's move on to you. You've got heaps of heaps of stuff to say too. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think with um, with pre-shipment inspections, right, it's very, very important to let your supplier know before you start the order process, before you confirm the order, you have to let them know that you will be arranging pre-shipment inspections because once they know that an inspection will happen, well, now they're going to start to manufacture it to a high standard because they know it's going to be checked. I mean, they may have been making it to a high standard anyway, but now they're definitely going to have a lot more attention on it to make sure that it can pass an inspection. So that's just a very good thing to do, even if you do or don't go for the inspection. Now, I highly recommend that you inspect every single order because mistakes can happen, even though like it's not deliberate. Sometimes mistakes just generally happen. And that's the whole purpose of pre shipment inspections that they pick these things up. But in terms of like paying for the inspection, you should always pay for the inspection. But then if the inspection fails, then the supplier pays for the reinspection. That's generally how it goes. So don't worry that, oh, what if it fails and I have to pay for three or four inspections? No, you only pay for the first one. And if it fails, the supplier pays for it after that. And also like to people who think, oh, well, what if next, what, this inspection is too expensive? Consider the value of the order hmm. versus the cost of the actual inspection. And not only the value of the order of the price that you're paying the supplier, but the value of the goods that you're getting on the retail price. Because you might pay your supplier $25 for a product, but you might retail it at 100 But now you can't get that $100 sale because you didn't pay for that $180 inspection, but you've got a 1,000 of those $100 products. You know what I mean? So just think about it. It's, it's one unit, basically, 
uh, is the cost for that particular inspection. So I've been burnt a couple of times on inspections when I didn't do an inspection because I had very good relationships with my manufacturers and I was like, oh, they would never screw me over. So actually I can just, we've been placing this order a few times, everything's been fine, so I don't need to do the inspection anymore. But um, then mistakes have happened that they weren't aware of, which has come back to bite me in the ass. For example, we were doing uh, military boots uh, for the UK army and um, one of the production lines used like a silver pen for like the, for the cutting lines of the leather. And normally they use a different color pen and, or, or they could wipe it off or something like that. This time it didn't wipe off. And then we got like 20,000 boots arriving in the UK with silver marks on them. And I'm like, what the hell is this? But there was no inspection, but an inspection would have picked up immediately and they would have polished that at the factory. Instead, we had to open up all the boxes in our warehouse in the UK, polish all the boots. And you can imagine the astro astronomical cost of that compared to just if we got an inspection done in China. Hmm. Now, what was quite cool is when I lived in China for a few years, I actually went and inspected the orders myself. Cause, and I had my own checklist, just like QC companies do. And I'm like, I want to put myself through an inspection. So I learned a lot about it as well. And I learned a lot about the relationships between factories and the inspectors. Now, factories, if you have a good relationship with them, will tell you that they don't like inspections. They don't like inspectors uh, because there's kind of like a bribe culture in China. And that's not to like scare you off to be like, oh, it only passed because it got a bribe. They'll still pass or fill your inspection if it had to, but they still also want to collect their bribe. And if they don't get a bribe, then that's when they would fill it. So it's also important to sort of understand that culture, but also know that that's just their culture and we can't change that. So just because someone's looking for a bribe doesn't mean that like you shouldn't be doing an inspection. It's just, it's just the way it goes over there, but you'll still get the accurate result uh, on the inspection form. And what was really interesting was when I lived in China, I was like, okay, cool, let me check this out for myself. So I went to a factory that I was going to anyway, which I was placing an order for. And then I ordered the inspection from a third party company and I stayed in the factory and I just said, look, if they ask who I am, just say I'm a buyer from another company. I just want to watch what they do. And the inspection was supposed to start at 10 a.m. The inspector showed up at 12 o'clock, two hours late. And then he said, uh, We're losing your audio a bit there, Kian. Uh, you may have gone out. Um, there he is. Kian, you back? Oh, I'm, I'm back. Oh, yeah, I'm back. Yeah, sorry. you're back now. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so then. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, and then he said, I'm not doing this inspection until I get my lunch. So they had to order him lunch. And then, so I still got the accurate report, but the inspector was being an idiot. And that's just kind of like the culture over there. So don't get like swayed by I, inspector I, behavior. I left it's my inspection company for that very reason that, they, that I had the inspector and the factory talking about, oh, no, no, come back later on today. Oh, you've been traveling. And they, they made the arrangements between them. And then when I said, where is the report? I've done my bollocks because I'm like, well done. You can't make those arrangements behind my back to say, I will come back later and you can leave earlier for the day because you've got to get a rush off and get a train. That's unacceptable. I actually switched inspection companies because of that reason because that for me was just way too cosy with the factory. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. I, I then... actually think that it's, a, it's an important subject to – like I'm the opposite with Ken on this because um, Ken and I agree on most things. There's some things that we're on the opposite. Bribery in China is a huge issue uh, hmm. when it comes to inspection companies. I, I speak about this on the YouTube video that I made on inspections and it's part of the biggest issue that there is when it comes to inspection companies. And I guess this is also where Ken's probably also going to speak about why he uses certain types of companies that he uses. But um Bribery, when it comes to this, like in general, it's a huge issue in China, but especially these inspection companies, like to to make an inspection company in China is very simple. They can just go and make any sort of random website and call themselves an, um, an inspection company and get into a million different Facebook groups and say that that's what they are. And the thing is that a lot of people that are that watch like they're in these Facebook groups, they'll just see somebody, you know, who says that they, someone could, I'm honestly going to go like really far and say, they can go and take like some random American guy's Facebook image and put them as their image and pretend like they're, they're like some, you know, non-Chinese person from America that's living in, in China and call themselves an inspection company when really, it's just like some random person. This kind of stuff exists. And I don't want people to start getting all scared or anything, but people need to know that this happens. Have yeah. we lost Ken? I think we have, yeah. I'm going to say some hellos in the feed while we comes okay. back, and then we'll return back okay. to what you're saying there, Sharon. Uh, yeah. Jason says, interesting topic, guys. Looking forward to this, where the conversation goes. Then Elchin says, hi, all. Nice to see you all. 
Pat Taylor says, hope you guys are well. Owen says, inspection every time, period. Martin says, how do you determine what inspection should focus on? Is there a list? We'll come to that. I'll come back to you there. Michelle says, Kian Sourcing King. Maui says, hello, guys. Abdu says, hello, everyone. Um, Facebook user, I'm not sure who this is, but we'll get to this. He says, can you guys talk about creating a contract with a factory? Is there a fill in the blank somewhere I could use? Or uh, we've been using invoices with product specifications. So we'll get into that as well. Martin says, hello. Uh, Jess said, sorry, Jesse says, hello. Tiffany Hepburn is here. Good morning, everyone. Just looking in the feed. Amit's here. Khalid's here. David's here. Uh, Alex is here. Uh, Ricky is joined. The feed. Lobi's here as well. Daniel's also joined. Hey, Annalise, welcome back. Sav, Claire, uh, and Yael Kibeli. She'll be on here with me tomorrow. Let's see if we can bring Keon back into the mix. Are we there? He had this issue a bit earlier today. Yeah, he's he's been freezing. All right, so while yeah. we're waiting for it, that to 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 kind of sort out, I can out answer internet. some of some of those as well. Um, yeah. By the where, way. Yeah. So where do you, Kian? We got you well, back. I'm able to my products on Amazon with one account. I believe I heard Sharon say that on the last call. Just curious, trying to learn. So. Can I answer? Are we? Are we? Yeah, go, you go for that one, and then yeah. we'll bring Kian back in. Yeah. So, hold on. Wait. How are you able to do multiple brands products on Amazon with one account? I personally have um, every single brand. I've got three brands. Each one has a separate account, and it's easier to get. I heard that you guys said that it's always been easy to get. Um, I went through shit to do that, like two years ago. But I, um, I had to say that it was for, for tax reasoning. But I know that today you're allowed to have multiple. Um, yeah, it's, it's, so good, it's so good we split him up into two. Look, it's two of him now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you can have more than one brand on one account. Um, mm -hmm. if, uh, for You don't actually have to have like a trademark, but you can have an actual brand on one account. You can have more than one. We specifically, each one of our brands sells totally non-related products. So in the past... I don't know how it is today because I did hear that Danny, you guys, and Yael was here, said something else. But when I made more than one account, you had to prove that they're that totally was, separate Yeah, that products. was before August last year. But then Amazon yeah. waited nine months to announce that you can now do this without having to ask permission and going to performance. But that has been that way since August last year. Since they August? didn't mention it. Uh huh. It's yeah. interesting because so basically what that means is if t now I wanted to go make another account um, under a new totally different LLC and et cetera, I don't have to prove that it's totally separate products. Is that what you're saying? Yep. You haven't you got to prove can. anything, but ideally you, you don't want to, you don't want to cross products from one account to another because yeah. that's like cross, well, that's like cross sending across the accounts. You'll get suspended for that. Ideally, we know there's two main reasons, right? You want to sell the business and tax implications. If you've got different partners on them, it's a headache, right? Dealing with any kind of a commerce payout is an absolute ball ache to deal with, especially multi-country, multitude of VAT, et cetera, when you're going across network in the, like the UK, if you're using EFN or you're using, um, oh, what's the name of it? I forgot the name of it now. EFN. I don't know what, what EFN is. Your facility network there. What's the one where you multi-country? EU. I'm drawing a blank now. Amazon always what? plugging it. When you sell in the EU on Amazon, multiple countries. I don't sell on it. Ah, I okay. Sell yeah. it, yeah. You have to be registered with seven, uh, seven VAT points, yeah, because he's got the five countries plus the two storage country. I just it escapes me now. Penny you. That's it. Fucking hell. Yeah. Okay. Me out. <laughs> So, yeah, so if you're dealing with that and you are trying to sell products across a single account from different brands and, di you know, it just becomes a complete mess. So, as you know, a separate account, each brand, each point of taxation, it just makes sense. But, but you don't have to have, so you don't actually have to have a different brand. You can't no. a, a different account. You can have all your brands on one account. I specifically don't, yeah. don't work in that way, but if yeah. I did – that over again today and it was just me i didn't have any partners or anything i don't think i'd make separate accounts today hmm. because it's not the same as it was back then yeah we just got a dozen <laughs> messages everyone's coming panny you panny you panny you panny you 
Fogs. <laughs> a bit of brain fog there. Yeah, sorry. Okay, where were we? So basically what it comes down to, the, the going back to the question there, is can I sell across multiple uh, in multiple brands in a single account? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. But it becomes a fucking mess. So ideally you want to separate them, especially if you come to sell the business as well and you need to sell with the account because the account's got good standing history and um, – and feedback as well. So ideally, as best as you can, keep them separate where possible. 100%. It's actually a good subject also for whoever asked that to come on your thing tomorrow because, yeah, El Kabili has a company that sells pro, um, brands. Yeah. Um, okay, should we okay. get like, – there's some – There will these guys will answer these questions later, guys, but let's stay on subject, right, before we lost uh, Kian yeah. to the internet and now he's yeah. back again. We were talking pre-shipment, PSIs, pre-shipment inspections. We were talking about the issues. You were talking about um, backhanders and stuff like that, Sharon. Let's um, carry on to the next stage of that. Where, where yeah. are the briberies, the backhanders and stuff, yeah? Ah, yeah, I was talking about the bribery. Yeah. Uh, Ken, the, you can continue if you want as well. Sure, so sure. I was saying yeah. that I, I, I just be, when we lost you, I was saying that um, – there is a big issue in China when it comes to the bribery. And I said, I'm not trying to get people to be like scared of it, but it's important to know that it does exist. And that's why yeah. the company in which you work with is very, very important. That's what I always just said when I lost you. Exactly. Now I was going to be my next point is that like, it's very important to work with the reputable, reputable companies that have very high standards and you have to be mindful of like the fake inspection companies which so like don't take the cheap inspections off alibaba or anything like that you want to go like i like working with uh, companies like sgs and intertech uh, and bv and stuff like that international companies which have international offices so that if there ever is a fuck up with an inspection well they can then take responsibility for it and they're not going to walk away from it because they are a big company and um another thing i like to do is when i lived in china and i used to do the inspections myself and i um i would advise this to anyone who does actually go in to visit their manufacturer is it show how hard you test the products in front of the factory managers and the factory boss if you ever go to China? Because for example, like um, we, we were doing like outdoor furniture chairs and what I would do is I would pick up, like they would make these really expensive chairs which compact up and then they have a carry bag, but the carry bag they use was very cheap. And, um, but it's okay to use a cheaper bag because that's not the main purpose of the product, but it has to have very good quality stitching so it doesn't fall apart. And I wasn't happy with the stitching. So I basically grabbed the carry bag handle threw it up and down until the stitching came off the seams. And then they were like, what are you doing? Why are you tossing this bag up and down? And I was like, well, you don't understand. Like, you think this is a furniture chair that people use in their garden, but the main purpose is people who go to music festivals buy this sort of product and they toss it around. And then when I took the chair out, I stood on the chair and I stood on the handles, jumped up and down until they snapped. And they're like, why are you jumping up and down on this chair? I'm like, because this is what people do at music festivals. So I was really going to extreme measures, but I was educating my manufacturers on how people actually use product. And as a result, this is now the standards that they need to, to reach. So definitely don't be shy about breaking products in front of your manufacturer just to show how hard you're willing to test it. And then they know, all right, that's the buyer which doesn't mess around. That's a guy who actually checks this sort of, all, all this sort of stuff. So let's make sure that his products are manufactured to the highest quality. Hmm. There's questions coming in about selecting um inspection companies it is difficult if you can get someone who refers them not a facebook group speak to yeah. another seller that uses them over and over again that's probably going to be your best vehicle uh the guy i use andy church what i like about him is that he is based in the us i can deal with him but he's got the chinese team on the ground and he does flash inspections he hates me talking about it because I, i'm just want to know whether it's going to foul or not. I don't want to wait next day and they've got the train come back, photographs, report, delivered as a PDF. If it's foul, tell me. Don't waste my fucking time for 28 to 24 to 48 hours. So he doesn't like yeah. me talking about that. But I like him and I trust him and I can have a good conversation and he can talk to people in the factory on the day. And that's the problem sometimes is when you're dealing with a, an inspection company, it's like, yeah, we've sent the inspector out and there's no contact between you and the inspector, which is fine because you deal with the inspection company, but then there's no contact until they've returned home. And that's the bit that annoys me because there's so much time wasted in between. So if you can get flash inspections done or get early uh, reports to abort, because at the end of the day, you're going to pay for the inspection. You might as well kill it there and then. If it's not going to meet your AQL, just fuck it off and go, right, done for the day. This is not meeting the standards. I'm not wasting the rest of the day. And then maybe you can negotiate with the inspection company 
to stay on an extra day, pay them extra money and say, will you stay behind if they can make any corrections within that time period? Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's my rent over. Kian, who do you rate? So I work with a few companies and like I said, like kind of like the international ones, like I like Intertech, I like SGS and BV and BV stands for like Bueras Veristas or something like that. But sometimes like I work with the inspection company, which the retailer that I'm supplying has appointed. So sometimes you don't actually get a choice. Like if you're supplying a, a specific customer, they'll tell you this is the inspection company we want you to work with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, th th there's quite a few that I work with, but kind of like international ones. And I have worked with a couple of Chinese companies as well, but only if I've been to visit the office himself and I really, uh, myself, and I know who the company are. Yeah. Uh, for those asking, I've just po uh, posted Andy Church's his email in the feed. Fucking God help him when this gets published. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to get a, a firebomb inbox. Yeah, but be kind to him, guys. He's a really good guy um, and he's very helpful. So he's the guy that I use for inspections. Uh, yeah. Go on, sorry. Kim. Yeah, I was going to say the, the other thing is that's quite a common question that I get asked, like in uh, in my Facebook group as well. So I've posted quite a few links there uh, at certain times about inspection companies to work with. But as you said, Danny, as well, I think it's much better to go off like word of mouth of friends who have used inspection companies because there's so many going around. If you actually just do the search yourself, it's hard like to really trial and error and find the right ones. But if someone's worked with a good company and it's, they've not had any problems, then just take their recommendation and, and keep mm. it going. And, and it goes back to the same problem. If you, you know, people like have their own perception of things, right? So you might mm -hmm. say, someone might say, um, I use this inspection company and they were shit. And they weren't shit. It was just you had a shit product, shit factory. You didn't like yeah. what the report said. So you wanted exactly. to blame them. Then they get a bad name, which is unfortunate. So mm -hmm. it's probably Very best bad. to, you know, look between the lines and not just get one piece of feedback go online and, and ask a few people at the end of the day bad news does travel fast but sometimes good news does as well so make sure you do your research mm -hmm. um next where do you want to go next let's have a look i at I, have a, I have in my so i use a different company but i have in my facebook group um in the units section of the group <clears throat> an example of what an inspection report looks like Mm -hmm. um, which it's actually from two years ago and they, their in, it's, reports are even better today. And you've also got video reports today. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it's uh, so that people can also sort of get an understanding if there's any newbies who don't really know what a report really even looks like. And something mm -hmm. to add to that, um, I think someone asked what, before, how do you know what to, what to ask or something like that? Something is, what I've found over times of different types of products that I've, I've developed is sometimes I don't necessarily always know mm -hmm. of everything that needs to be checked. For example, I had a product once and I didn't even think that the inspection company needed to check if it smelled or not because it didn't even make sense. And yeah. then they came back and showed they, they took images and they had a video of the guy actually smelling it and then like they wrote that it smelled toxic. Yeah, right? and, and do you know where that comes from? Like that. It's called off-gassing. And sometimes is if you're using a certain material and that material then um, is cooling down and you bag it too fast, it creates an, yeah, creates an off gas. Yeah. yeah. So the thing is that a lot of these times, especially if you're working with a good inspection company, they would have also done inspections for, for products like that in the past. And they also know what to check for those specific products. But, of course, like, and Ken will probably be able to add to this, there are certain things that um, – people specifically like you should also really know your product really well and get them to check every single thing that's very very important to you especially something we should also speak about is when you have more than one um, supplier because that's totally two separate inspections as well actually that's it's actually a really important subject to speak about well the other thing well. that we missed off that we said when we're looking for an inspection company you should look for one that has experience with your type of product with your type of product yep mm -hmm. that's very key true. as well yeah 100%. Uh, okay, should we get into the technical side now, Kian? Let's talk about AQL. Yeah, and break that down, what that means to people that are unsure, what it means, what sure. the so, are and stuff. Exactly, yeah. So um, 
Sharon made a really good point about, um, you know, she's got a, an inspection report example in her group. And that's important to understand how to read these inspection reports, because mm. the most important thing is the AQL level, which stands for accepted quality level. Yeah. And that accepted quality level is like the industry standard. Uh, and you have three things. You have your minor defects, your major defects and your critical defects. Now, on any sort of standard product, you're allowed 4% minor defects, 2.5% major defects and zero percent critical defects and what that means like a minor defect might just be like a scratch on the surface it's tiny you can't really see it but it, it's minor and four percent of your order is allowed to be like that major is something like um the clip is the wrong color or something it's a pretty big problem uh, and critical means the product doesn't work and you're just not allowed any of those on, a, on, a, on an inspection report. So once you understand what those levels are and when you get your inspection report, like maybe, and as long as under 4%, 2.5% and you don't have any criticals, then it's gonna pass. And mm -hmm. sometimes you, you have an inspection that will fail, but it's gonna fail because there was maybe 6% minor defects rather than four. And you're like, well, actually 6% minor is not too bad. Maybe I'll just ask them to pull those examples out of the production. Maybe I'll get a little bit of compensation from a manufacturer and then it's good to go. So if you can understand like how to read a report, you can still act on it and you can still ship your goods even if it failed the report, but you have to understand like how to read it. And like some products have different AQL levels. Like for example, an inflatable airbed might have, you know, a higher AQL rate, like maybe six or 7% because one pin or one sharp object can just damage uh, and destroy that product. But then like other more common products have got a lower AQL level. So it's quite, and your, in this, your inspection company will help you determine what is the AQL level of that particular product. Um, and then what's also important to consider is that use that knowledge of the AQL levels to then claim returns from your manufacturer if you ever have any returns for your product. Because let's say you pass an inspection, you ship all the goods and you sell them on Amazon. But then let's say you get like 7% of your goods returned to you. And like, I'm not talking about the fake returns, I'm talking about like the real returns. If you get like 7% real returns, you can publish that information, you can screenshot it, you can send it to your supplier and hey, look, 100 of these, I ordered 100 of these, seven of them came back returned. So therefore I need to claim, you know, compensation for the seven units because that's above the AQL level. Yeah. And then quite often what they'll do is they'll either refund you for those or they will include seven extra free pieces, uh, pieces on your next order. So you can actually get the manufacturer to pay for all your returns if you understand your AQL levels. Yeah, that makes sense. Sharon, you want to add anything here? Uh, no, I just as Kia was was speaking, I was bringing up uh, the AQL levels report that I've got in front of me. No, it's on point. <laughs> cool. Um, testing your samples to industry and legal standards. Yeah. So. I this is quite an important topic, right? Because a lot of people just think that the pre-shipment inspection is all they need to do. But you can also actually just test your products before that to make sure that they are fit for purpose. And there's two types of tests you should be looking at that they're passing the legal standards and that they're passing the industry standards. Because a product like um, an iPhone charger will have legal standards that it's not supposed to blow up when you yeah. um, charge it in the plug socket. But like a coffee mug will not have legal standards, but it will have industry standards, such as the coating should not melt when you add mm -hmm. hot water to the coffee mug. So it's important for you to understand what these measures are, but you're not supposed to know that off the top of your head. You can contact similar QC companies like uh, Intertech that I mentioned. They also do like the product testing as well as a pre-shipment inspection. And they can tell you, if you say, hey, I'm importing this product from China to Germany or China to the USA, they'll tell you for what market, what testing regulations you need to pass by legally and what ones they recommend for. And then what you can do is you can go to your manufacturer and say, look, these are the regulations I need to pass for. Do you have the certificates to pass these? And they might show you certificates of examples of products that they have met those criteria for. But remember, it's very important to know that that's for another brand that they've tested for, not your brand. By them showing that they can pass allows you to understand they're capable of passing, but you mm -hmm. still need the documentation to show that they've passed for your brand. Because if you ever get called out by a retailer or Amazon or whatever for something be not being fit for purpose, you can show that document to say, hey, this third party QC company has inspected it, it passed the legal standards, therefore this product is fine. So that's always good to have in your back pocket. And depending on, the you know the type of item that it is sometimes these tests can be quite cheap like for example on backpacks i test the strength of the shoulder straps and the stitching and i apply 40 kilo weights to make sure that the shoulder straps don't break i don't have to do that but i do have it 
so you know you, you it's always good to have these documents uh in your back pocket and something like that maybe only costs like 80 dollars to inspect but something very technical like that they have to blow up and destroy might be like you know several thousand dollars so once you start speaking to these companies you can really understand what you want to test for and what you don't want to test for yeah you touched on a point about pre-shipment inspection because we're keeping it simple but at a higher level you're also checking materials aren't you there's inspections yeah. going there and then there's factory inspections and that's a whole new conversation uh just related conversation uh if you have random inspection what percentage of the product is normally to be checked first question and do they do a general look over do you want to answer that one Kian? yeah so yeah, what was the question again? So the base, so the percentage out of one hundred percent, what you get, what gets inspected, and yeah. then there's there an over like a general. I think it's just yeah. a pick and look inspection as well. So, so that's a good point. It, it completely depends uh, on the size of the order because if you've got like a thousand units or if you've got a hundred thousand units, if if you have the thousand units, you could ask them to check twenty percent, and you know checking two hundred units would be like a mandate. So they yeah. kind of go by how many they can inspect in one mandate because that's what you're paying for, like whatever it is, one hundred eighty to three hundred dollars for a mandate. But if you say that you want to check twenty percent, but it's for a hundred thousand units, that might take you know. 17 days and then mm. that will be a very uh, expensive uh, um, inspection so you can basically just stipulate right three mandates what can you do and they'll tell you okay we can inspect you know two and a half thousand out of your hundred thousand and you might say okay that's enough but yeah. what and in a good way around that is that like uh what they do is they pick the random boxes if they the the order has to be 100 percent complete before you arrange a pre-shipment inspection it has to be ready to ship they don't do it as they're making it. So when you have all those boxes ready, you take samples from like the 13th box, the 69th box, the 250th box, and it's completely random. So it's not like, oh, we've prepared these boxes for the inspection company and these are all gonna pass. So for that reason, it doesn't matter if you have a smaller sample size, it's completely randomized. So you'll be able to spot any defects uh, if they do occur. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Deepak here says, and I'll tell you a quick story. Make sure for Japan you do a full inspection. <laughs> I lost I my was actually got, I was actually going to say that sometimes you should have a full inspection, so it's good you're saying this. Yeah, so, so basically we launched a product in Japan about three years ago, and we did do an inspection with Moose Suppliers. It was a problematic product. Uh, it took six months after to fix and deal with all the shit. But basically, we had really struggled to get off in, in Japan. So I'd like ACOS was like two, two and a half thousand. And there was one search term for the market. There's no other search term. And then on desktop, it was at the bottom of the page. It never appeared at the top. So you'd have to scroll down. It was a fucking nightmare to deal with. And then that's when we started to go, okay, let's start doing some giveaways. So we converted our ads into Japanese. Got the And we managed to rank the product, got it to number seven. And then all the complaints start coming in. Then all the photographs, the stitching and everything. It was a complete mess. We had to completely abort. So we set up in Japan, done all this around this product, done the inspection. The good thing about Japan uh, with uh, China, it's seven days by sea. But it was a complete world of pain. We never ended up going back into Japan because it was such a mess to clear up. And that affect the production line on other orders. And the only thing that we can put it down to is that there's a possibility that after the inspection was done, the manufacturer, because he would order in all the materials from different locations, the zips and all this for this product, we think that before he shipped it, he did ship out some of the shitty products that didn't make it because he had to make a follow-up order to another territory for us. So mm. they've come in, they've inspected, they've unwrapped them, I believe. He swapped some of them out for the crappy ones put them into the Japan order, finished off the order for the UK and the EU, send that off. Um, and then, yeah, it was just a complete nightmare. So, yeah, same about Japan. And Japanese customers are like German customers. They're very fussy. They want high quality. Uh, they, they're they very, uh, what's the word? Um, they don't like to leave reviews and then don't okay. like to give uh -huh. five-star reviews either. So in Japan, so if you look at, um, for instance, I've done a, a few years ago. I don't know if I've got the slides. There's probably somewhere. There might be uh, Global Sources 2017. I've done launching in Japan. But what I show in there is to show you that you can have like um, a salad spinner. In Japan, there might be only one image up 
of the salad spinner with 30 reviews, but in the US it's got 3,000 reviews. And then I used the garlic press as an example. Might be 50, 50 reviews and four images, but in the US, 5,000 reviews. And so it just gives you an example there. The, the Japanese won't sit there and go, oh, yeah, let's give everyone a five star. They've always feel embarrassed if they're going to leave one. So that's also a struggle to get reviews. So it's not just the inspection that can, if you do inspect, it can still all go wrong as well and you've got to look at if it's a new product the cost of a launch so even though we got that product inspected and we got done over by the manufacturer and had a six month clear up which still costs us the fortune and time it's not even the money so even sometimes when you do get an inspection like you said you can't trust it but yeah was that a first time working with that um with that manufacturer no it wasn't the wow. first time. We'd, we'd worked with them a few times, but we did have some quality issues. I think what the problem was is that this was a small outfit when we used that guy. And then when we mm -hmm. expanded and said, okay, we want you to send to the EU, we want to send to the UK, and we also want you to send to Japan, suddenly he, could, he, he was like, he will say yes to everything because no one likes to say no, and he bit off more than he can chew. That's what I, I think it will put it down to. <laughs> I've got a supplier. I just put in an order for um for a, we sell a type of product for women after they give birth, and it's got an adhesive to it. And we just ordered, um, made an order like maybe two weeks ago. And the supplier, I wish I was I was while we've been speaking, I was trying to see if I could show you guys the thing without revealing the product, but I can't. Anyway, my supplier sent me a message, and she said, "Shan, we're really sorry, but." there's something wrong with the adhesive same supplier as the last time but it's a totally different product hmm. and like that's that's something about also having that type of relationship with that with your suppliers as well because it's not if you guys can and you guys can say this as well it's not to be taken for you know for granted that i have a supplier who lets me know that there's like a fuck up with the product that hmm. usually doesn't happen hmm. but she knows that if i get bad reviews and then there's going to be an issue there like i'm i'm going to ditch her and find someone else so yeah. it's in her best interest to let me know, but that also like that's not to be taken taken for granted that uh, that she even sends me that. Cool. Deepak says selling Japan for three years. It's true. Japanese like it if you have a lot of social proof. Abu says, Danny, yes, it was cross border summit in April two thousand eighteen. So that's my launching in uh, Japan. So you might okay. find that on on uh, on YouTube somewhere if you want to have a look at that. Uh, Andrea says, so it's like Sharon says, sometimes you do not know until the end what you need to test for. How do you then establish the conditions for a failed inspection with your supplier? Like smell, for example, never crossed my mind. So it did not put it under the failed inspection condition. That's cool because you can get unraveled here, can't you? Something that you would consider a fail is just you didn't realize it was on the list, you know? Mm -hmm. But so, that's kind of why you pay your inspection companies, though, because they help you find out these sort of things that we didn't necessarily yeah. think to ask for. And if you don't have eyes and ears in the factory, either yourself or a member of your team, then inspection companies will bring this to your attention. Yeah. Sharon? I've, I've personally not been in a situation where I've had an inspection fail on something ridiculous. Um, but for this specific example with, with the smell, it wasn't in any sort of PO or in any sort of agreement, but they just like accepted it and redid the order. That that's what happened here. But I haven't worked with brand new suppliers for like I think over a year and a half. Most of my suppliers I've had a long term relationship with them is is the truth. So I haven't yet been in a situation that I can remember where I've I've had something like this happen. But if they want your business, they're going to do like they won't let you leave unhappy that's in my experience i don't know if like like what you guys have to say about that but hmm. i've been I've, I've worked with terrible horrible suppliers in the past it took me a long time to find my handful of like perfect suppliers that, that well, it just becomes it's like you've done your first youtube video me doing the first seller sessions you just shit at what you do at the very beginning you learn don't you and and <laughs> yeah. if you don't learn you're out of business uh, Joe says, does anyone uh, not do an inspection during a production to avoid 10,000 units produced and find something wrong? What do you think? I think what we're saying here, Joe, is that I talked about flashing inspections or aborting early. Kian? Yeah, this is a really important point and something I forgot to mention is that prior to inspections, you have to have a very solid sample process. 
And what I always do, I go through three samples before confirming any order, right? You have your counter sample. Your counter sample is like your first one, like the idea product. It might be your competitor sample or it might be a sample you sent to them. You want to make some changes to it. Anyway, the, the manufacturer develops a sample that you want. And then you get what's called your pre-production sample. That's a sample that you're like, okay, this is what I want to order. You've made all my changes. It's the right color. It's got my logo on it. I am now confirming this for production. And then they go into production. They manufacture your 10,000 units, as you say. And then they send you a pre-shipment sample, which is a sample from the actual production. Now, what you have to do is compare the pre-production sample with the pre-shipment sample side by side. And they have to be like for like, they have to be exactly the same. And if there's any problems or if there's any differences or discrepancies between those samples, then you don't go ahead and either pay your supplier or arrange the inspection until it's actually been checked. But you checking and testing your pre-production sample before the supplier goes into manufacturing is what prevents you having any problems when you inspect those final 10,000 units. Do you want to give units. people quickly just the names? There's various names for different stages of samples in there. There's production sample. What else is there? It's three or four. Yes. So I, I just go by three. Your, your counter sample, which is your yep. first one, your, your pre-production sample, which is what yep. you've confirmed for them to go into production, and, and then your pre-shipment sample, which yep. is essentially what they've made. Some people have the gold, the bronze, gold, bronze, yep. silver, and gold. I just go yep. counter pre-production and pre-shipment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that um, makes sense. Okay, yeah. so we kind of should get to this because we've been asked this a few times. Let's kind of help people understand of how they should put something together because it's it's uh, it's a chicken and egg thing. You just don't know how it's going to pan out. But uh, what can we do to actually? prepare you can't with accuracy because you don't know there's too many variables prepare this uh, specification sheet before contacting the supplier when starting a new product sometimes there seems to be details which you are learning while we take talking to suppliers which is true i have you guys done this you've gone and uh, sourced the product you think you know what's going on like you think you know a lot about the product and as you do more and more research and the different factories that you speak to ask more and more questions mm -hmm. more and more stuff ends up on your list doesn't it so this mm -hmm. is a good point what he's saying now um so what do you do what is your process to to document all of this like a list is there a hit list of 20 do you do research on the net do you ask um the suppliers probing questions to build that list or do you ask them for a specification list sorry i'll leave you room to answer the question there yeah i mean uh, so, okay. yeah yep. yeah so I, I would say that like, again, you have to sort of educate yourself on your product because like, and you do this by talking to many, many different suppliers before you actually go to the supplier that you want to go to. So for example, if you want to do a product that you have no idea about the specification of that particular product, well, ask the first supplier to send you a specification sheet and then they'll be like, okay, this has got like lead materials, it's got aluminium, this is, these mm -hmm. are the dimensions, these are the fabrics. And then start asking your questions to that first supplier to be like, all right, What's, why do people take nylon instead of polyester here? This, why are you doing double stitching here? Like, why are you using this thickness of diameter of steel? And like, yes, that's not the supplier you should be working with because you've just showed your complete lack of experience, but you're using one supplier to build up all your knowledge on that product. So that when you go to your next supplier and ask for the quotation, you say, hey, by the way, we need to have like this thickness of aluminium and this polyester material because for the German market, we require this standard. And then your next supplier is going to be like, oh, they know exactly what they want. They must be an experienced buyer. So, like, don't. Um, so, so that's why, like, you know, on Alibaba, maybe ask like five or ten suppliers all the questions that you want before you go and actually reach out to the good suppliers. Yeah. And likewise, at, at the Canton Fair, you have conversations face to face with like five or ten different suppliers, and then mm. pick from there which one you actually want to work with. But you learn yeah. from those exchanges. Exactly. And one of the things I tried to do, and it failed miserably, I thought I'd be really clever by creating the spreadsheet with all these questions in. And I thought if I can share this spreadsheet with the factories, they will go ahead and complete all the fields in the spreadsheet. And then I could cut and paste into one long spreadsheet and compare the answers to all the factories. But they never do it because they never fully answer. They stay very vague. Like when you do like a long question list, it's like too much too soon, isn't it? So you end up getting a little bit of information here and a response here. And then you keep asking them saying, did you get the spreadsheet? Could you complete the questions on the sheet? And then they'd only answer another bit. So it's almost like... um like what you said is that you almost want to use the first five or 10 factories as your learning process about the product and the needs of that product so that people then take you seriously. They go, well, we're not going to pull the wool over this person's eyes because they obviously know what they're talking about. Exactly. 
Uh, when bundling, this is an interesting one. Uh, when bundling, if so, one factory finished earlier, do you do inspection straight away or wait until the end of the whole production? I guess you want to have is, separate inspections. Yeah. This is exactly what I said earlier that we should speak about when you have more than one supplier, like mm -hmm. when you create a bundle. So I specifically will have two, well, you could have three inspections, but each supplier will have an inspection. So before, if I'm bundling product A, and product B, and let's say supplier A is selling, sending the product to supplier B and they're doing the final bundle, mm -hmm. the product will not leave supplier A until I've had an inspection in yep. suppliers A. They will send it to supplier B and I will also have an inspection there as well. Yep. So yeah, you have two, you, it depends on the product. You may even have three, three different ones at that time. Yep. But yeah, you, you have an inspection in every, every warehouse when you're bundling. Yep. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, I'm curious that we're coming up to the hour point here. Let's go into NDAs and NNN. Explain what both documents are, Kian, if you don't mind, and then we'll unpack it. Yeah, sure. So your non the NDA is your non-disclosure agreement, and your NNN is non-disclosure, non-use, and non-circumvention. And um, so I think Sharon and I have like different views on this because of the different sort of nature of customers that we work with. And like, for me, I don't like getting my suppliers. I mean, with all the orders that I've done, I've only ever got a supplier to sign one NNN document. And I don't like getting them to sign those documents because, you know, you're showing a bit of a lack of trust to say, hey, I want you to manufacture my order, but I don't trust you that you're not gonna show this to anyone else. So I want you to sign this document. Whereas I've kind of built all my factories relationship, well, based on strong relationships and strong relationships is built on trust. And mm -hmm. I know they don't wanna screw me over because I'm placing good orders and my business is growing. So. I care a lot more about the relationship rather than the legal formalities because if they want to copy a product at any time they can like i think one of these documents is just well, a piece of if you don't mind me saying you look at sony you look at apple right you look yeah. at nike got the best legal team in the world but their shit still gets knocked off in china what hope have we got yeah well yeah, exactly. yeah, this is this is where Karen no, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking Sharon now look i knew that yeah. no, I'll, I'll tell you what i'll tell you what because Kian yeah. and like, i met yeah. Ken and I met because of, and I'm so thankful that this happened because Ken and I have become really good friends since then, um, because of a client that, that I have that was inventing a product and um, and NNN was really important to us. And Ken, the difference, and Ken and I were speaking about this, the difference between us is I've never been in China. I've been sourcing for half of my life from China and I've never been in China and I've done pretty okay. <laughs> But the fact that I have never been in China and that I, we were supposed to go to China this year, obviously, it's not going to happen. But the point is that I was saying to Ken, a lot of the people watching us are not going to go to China. You don't have to fly to China in order to do online business. It's great if you can, but you don't have to. So for the people who don't, it does take longer time for us to build that trust with the Chinese. So I specifically, and I'm sorry if there's anyone here who, who's specifically a Chinese supplier, I don't trust anyone, anyone, doesn't matter who you are, until you prove to me that I can trust you. And I will, with every single supplier, when I come in with a different, with a new product, have an NNN done. I use the Aoka Bailey for it. I have an NNN done and I will spend how much money I need for that. So in saying that, if you have some sort of patent design or whatever in America, which is not that expensive for you to have, yes, they can't use your exact design in America or whatever it may be, but they can still sell your product um, to, to different types of, um, uh, to other countries, etc. And not only that, sometimes when you're working, like I could be working with two different suppliers before I make the final decision, which supplier I'm going with. I will have an in and done, in and done with both of them because I don't 100% know which, with one, which one I'm going. And I've gone and put a lot of time and effort into that specific design. So I get like, so Ken and I, um, Ken's all about the trust because he's physically there a lot of the time, like most of the time he's physically there and he's built up this, this, like this trust with them where I will trust them after a few years, but it's going to take time for me to get to that point, if that makes sense. And I put them through a lot of tests, my suppliers. Yeah. So it's context, basically your Ken's trust comes from being there a friendly face on the ground, you won't go to China or you don't go to China. Therefore, that's your wave of protection. That's your new layer, if, yeah? If you have a Chinese entity, you don't yeah. need to worry. But I yeah. don't. Hmm. So that's why I have an NNN done. 
Okay, the, this got, question got asked earlier and I missed it. Sorry, guys. Uh, speaking of trust, could you guys talk about creating a contract with the factory? Is there a fill in the blank somewhere I could start with? Or we've been doing using invoices and product specifications so far. Any insight and appreciate it? Thanks. Either okay, guys. You yeah. go first, I'll go after. So I've, I've got like a purchase order template that I use, which is basically got the purchase order basic information on it but with the purchase order i always send a terms and conditions document and the terms and condition document stipulates like you know the the carton dimensions the, the printing on the cartons but in there it's also got a few things that says like this is the delivery date of the order as per the po if you're over 14 days late on the on the delivery date then you have to air freight 30 percent of the goods at your own expense so like, and they have to sign that with their company chop and there's a few other terms in there as well. So that I know that I'm protected that I'm, I'm not going to get my goods like one month later than we've agreed. And there's like consequences as a result of that. So that's just something that I've built up over time and from like orders going bad or, or whatever, I've just added things in, but I wouldn't say that there's like a template online that you can access, but uh, it's just like trial and error. You add in things that you like uh, with your order and then uh, you get the, the factory to sign that on, on every single order. Uh, even if Karen. even if you even if you do have um uh, look i've got a purchase order sample in my unit section of the group i have every file that you need in the unit section of my group um but i write there that it doesn't actually mean jack shit that's the truth unless it's in chinese and it's signed by chinese lawyers or it's it stamped. doesn't actually yeah. stamped yeah it doesn't actually mean anything so a lot of the people watching us are going to be working through alibaba and trade assurance and things like that what I do, what I recommend, because I don't any, work with my with Alibaba anymore because I don't need to, but what I recommend for newbies to do if they're going to be working through trade assurance is to have a, a purchase order of some sort as your, like so that you know what, what are the things that you need to, to have them um, agree upon and then have them, because all the communication has got to be through Alibaba, have them um, upload your agreement from their side where it's signed and that's only going to be good enough for trade assurance. Like you can't sue them or anything on that, but that's only going to cover you with Alibaba. If that makes sense. Did I explain that good enough? Yep. Uh, yep. Joanne's okay. left a few messages here all related. So with the NNN, they sign when before a discussion, any modification ideas or when placing the order in the purchase order. The second thing she says, the purchase order agreement I have for those terms they tend to not respect them. Uh, and what she's mm -hmm. saying here is not enforceable. They still share packaging ideas, etc., with others. What's your take on that? The only thing that will protect you is the NNN. If they share your package ideas and things like that, um, first of all, I test, I personally test a supplier beforehand and I ask them questions about other, um, other s sellers and things like that. If they openly share with me, what other people are doing. I already know that I can't trust them not to share my stuff. And it, in my experience, like I know I've tested my suppliers in the past and I know that they won't give me uh, information on my supply, exactly on my competitors. Um, they'll do their best to try and hide it. I find it in the end, but they do their best. But the only thing that will protect you from my experience, um, and, and I work with, in my opinion, like the best lawyers and that work in China. In my experience, the only thing that protects you is the NNN. Mm -hmm. Danny, cool. do you agree on that? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of in Kian's group in the sense that there's a level of trust, but then I don't like it. takes time to, to build it. Yeah, it takes time to build it. And I only now source one product from China. The rest is done in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, and that one product, we work with a sourcing agent, which is another question that come up earlier on because I know Kian's, that's not his thing, but that's where, you know, you agree to disagree. I have him to do that. He takes a percentage of pr production. Originally, once he did, went through the stage of sourcing the factory, he owns a relationship. I get that. I bought into that. Don't have a problem with that at all. But um, So my trust is with him, and, it's, and he's a uh, British guy based in Iwu, um, and I've met him plenty of times. So my trust is in him and not the factory. That's now, it's relied on on him to be in the controlling seat to make sure he's on the ground, which he is, and with his Chinese wife, who obviously speaks the language, knows that when they're going to the factory, that we've got most points covered, but you're never 100% 
uh, protected. Um, Cy B says, sorry, Kian, how many times have you had to call on the 14 days clause and has the factory sent 30% by air? Sorry, and we'll yes. get back to you as, in a moment, Sharon. Yeah, no, so, so uh, it, it's happened a few times and I have enforced it. And I've enforced it even when I haven't had to, like if a 14 day delay would have been okay, but I enforced it just to show that this is serious. And you can, because I've had, I have customers in the UK, like retailers, uh, like Argos and Tesco and Aldi, that if you're a day late, they'll fine you for a percentage of the order. Mm -hmm. And so if anyone's ever late with my delivery dates, and I do enforce that just to say like, don't mess around. And if they do get stung hard because they have to pay for 30% air freight, then they're never going to make that mistake again with me because they know the, the consequences of it. So yeah, I, I have enforced it and it doesn't happen very often, but because you say that they're going to be a lot more likely, like let's say for example, they've got another order on a production line. They're going to take that other customers off and put yours on to make sure that they ship yours out on time because you have that clause in your contract. But if you never had that clause, then they're just going to delay it and they're like, oh, well, there's no consequences of that delay. Look, is if they decide not to air freight it, like you're still in the same situation you were before. But at least if you have it, that's going to get them on their toes to always meet the delivery date. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry, going back to you, Sharon, I cut you off. Apologies. Um, I was just going to say with your sourcing company, the, mm. the guy, the UK guy, though, he probably has a Chinese entity, which is... Oh, he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. he just... So that, he's, that's the difference between when you're working as someone who doesn't have a Chinese entity, when you're working with a supplier without a middleman, when you don't have a sourcing agent course, and you're trying yeah. to... That, that's why... Because I, I do want to... I just want to say, I do... It's important to trust your suppliers. If you don't trust someone, you can't but, work with but, but you see, for the same question... We come up and we're respectful for each other's answers. Our predicaments, are, our predicaments are different. So it's never going to give you the same answer because Kian doesn't agree with using um, sourcing agents. I do it out of convenience and I'd rather pay experts to do certain things so that I can, I, you know, I have multiple businesses to run. I try and work on the businesses and not in the businesses. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I pay people that I trust to do that. But so the answer to that question, there's three different answers from three different people who had three yeah. different approaches, right? You yeah. won't go to China, right? You won't go to China. That's your protection. He loves being in China, which is crazy. Uh, I don't know how many people can just go out there and live there for six months and I, I can't get on with it. I, I've, I've done China a few times. I've had terrible experiences like with internet connections and stuff like that. I love Chinese people, got some great friends, but I, I don't enjoy staying there for long periods of times out, out of my natural habitat, right? But um, so my point is there's, there's the answer is from three different people for three different reasons. So, yeah. Cool. And, to the user, you, Go on. Oh, sorry, and, and to the listeners, you just have to listen to all three approaches and see which fits for you because none of right. us are right or wrong. You know what yeah. I mean? You just there is no right or wrong here. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. We right. should start to think wrapping soon, but there is one last part of this call. We need to talk about payment and payment protection. I know we've we've alluded to this on the call before, but sure. we are in a situation with COVID nineteen factories working on little margins and stuff, and they could be the best factories in the world, but they could disappear, unfortunately. So. Yeah, the, the, the thing I wanted to mention with this is like COVID or no COVID, because we're talking about like quality checks and inspections and stuff like that, there's some quality checks you have to do with payments as well. And it's very important that once you've placed a few orders with a factory and you have regular payments going through, be mindful of payment scams that can happen. And, and they've happened to me before as well. That if you ever get an email request, uh, that before you're about to make a payment, if you ever get an email from your factory, uh, from the employee or the boss or whatever saying that we've had to change our bank details now pay your order into this account yeah the number one thing you should do whenever that happens is phone your supplier and phone your boss and say did you want me to change the bank account details because what's happened to us a few times is that our suppliers have had their email accounts hacked and then mm -hmm. when they get hacked they're reading the emails they're reading the emails and they're waiting for that time to say right we're about to arrange the payment and then when they see that email that's when they interject and say okay pay our new bank account details and then they hope to receive the account before the, the money before they find out, which is why you, you don't just send a WeChat message because you don't know what could happen there as well. Phone them and say, did you want us to change the bank account details? And the other thing that's happened as well, which is uh, quite bad, was that sometimes the employees in that company, the sales staff are about to leave the company and mm -hmm. they say, 
hey, by the way, uh, we've requested that you pay into this account. And that's just a bank account that the employee of the company have just set up on the site. So that's yeah. why you, you have to phone the boss. And, you know, on previous um, podcast episodes, you know, we always talking about the boss and the relationship and stuff like that. That's why this stuff is important, because you have to have a direct line of communication with the mm. decision maker and the boss of these companies, because they can even get screwed over by their own employees. Yeah. And then and, and so and that could leave you in a very tough situation. So I think like as a as a seller, you have to ask yourself the question do i have a direct line of communication with the factory boss that i'm buying from and if you're buying from a sourcing agent then you probably don't mm. and do you know the boss's name can you pick up the phone right now and give him a call and if you don't then you need to create that line of communication in case problems like this arise yeah sharon any parting words before we go i really 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 quickly just want to add to what cb just said the question that you put here on the thing mm -hmm. That's not 100% true. Um, I have a client who took the jade roller. I've just, I've got it here. So it was the first thing that came to my mind, the normal jade roller, and she made it electronic and she didn't have the money to have a patent on it, which was very unfortunate. Um, and she was the first one who created that. And then it wasn't flying off the shelves yet, but within two months they had sent it to everyone else. So it's not 100% that they're not gonna copy you until you're working on your next product. Um, if you've got a really good idea and you've differentiated a product 100%, first time you're working with that supplier, they, they could copy you from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, ben Valent says, experience that scam key and cost 100 grand. Wow, that's a bad one. There you go. That's that's a, I feel one. sorry for you. Yeah. Cool. Let me tell you guys what we've got coming up on the show this week. So uh, Yale's back tomorrow. We're going to talk fighting hijackers on Amazon from a legal perspective. Then Thursday's part four of Shopify and off Amazon. Friday, we've got awesomers.com versus seller sessions with myself and Steve Simonson. Saturday, we've got women of Amazon in-depth profile with Michelle Aventon. Sunday is mindset Sunday. And we're going to do law of attraction, pay it forward with uh, Lee Rand Hirschkorn. And Sharon, before you go, you are one of the the team that is appearing at Branded by Women as well. What will you be covering? Uh, I am covering PPC. Uh, and, uh, not just everyone. PPC, but I, I mean, I went through it. Like you've you edit, you done all the edits yourself. It's like forty minutes long. It's very yeah. in depth on the more basic end of PPC, but it's a very yeah. in depth review for people out there who want to check that out. So. Go and grab a free ticket, brandedbyatwomen.com. We went live yesterday. Any technical problems, let us know because no launches go normal on the first day. So, uh, yeah, we're two days in. Um, tickets are going well. But, yeah, looking forward to having you there. I look forward to getting you guys back next week or the week after. We'll do another session. We'll just come up with some content. Uh, Jason says, great conversation, guys. Some very good points and perspectives. Thanks for that. Uh, Andrea says, yes, that happened to me. Lucky it seemed so weird I asked. Um, who else have we got here we've missed off the list? Joanne said about packaging. Uh, she said, yes, agreed on testing. That's how I've seen other packages. And we also got from Facebook user, thanks for answering my questions. Okay, I think that's us done for the day, guys, yeah? So you yeah. have a wonderful week. I look forward to seeing you both soon. Guys, stay home, stay safe. Hopefully we'll get some news in the next couple of weeks to get see if we get let down of lockdown or let out of lockdown. lockdown. In the meantime, stay safe, stay home. Much love. Take care. See you tomorrow, 4 p.m. BST. See you guys. Bye.